factors that you have been discussing today are one of really the most important legal options that are available for people who experience domestic violence. And both the ex parte orders and final relief from abuse orders are both essential and time limited safety tools for survivors. And RFAs can provide many different safety mechanisms, such as limitations on contact, temporary custody arrangements, financial support, um, and may also include firearm surrender conditions. And each relief from abuse order that is issued by the court is really tailored to match the circumstances of the abuse um, and the abuse that the plaintiff uh, outlines in their affidavit and petition. And essential from our perspective is the fact that RFAs are a civil legal tool. And so they provide an opportunity for survivors to seek legal protection from the court without involving uh, the criminal system. And that's something that's very important to, to many survivors and the reason why relief from abuse orders are such, such an important tool. I just wanted in terms of the broad context to um, state that certainly seeking court or legal relief of any sort for survivors of domestic violence is an inherently dangerous moment. And victims of domestic violence are at the highest risk for lethality, for being killed by their abusive partner when they leave an abusive situation. And unfortunately, as this committee has heard uh, before, domestic violence really, domestic violence homicide rather, remains a persistent problem in Vermont. And over half of all of our homicides in Vermont since 1994, since this data has been tracked, uh, were domestic violence related and over half of those were committed with firearms and there's a higher rate still for the crimes that are murder suicides that are associated with domestic violence. And because uh, domestic violence can pose such dire consequences, really life or death in the worst situations, it's essential that this tailored emergency relief provides protection for victims when they need it the most, which is the importance of the emergency proceeding or the ex parte proceeding. As the committee has been discussing, um, the network supports the purpose of 133 to really clarify and codify existing court practice. Um, so right now across our state each day, survivors of domestic violence seek emergency protection through the ex parte process to apply for relief from the court. And currently, judges may and do include firearms related conditions in relief emergency relief from abuse orders. If there's a factual basis, which indicates that firearms, uh, that the plaintiff may need some protection from firearms related violence or there have been firearms related threats. And I just wanna highlight briefly three reasons why we think H-133 uh, will improve the family court's response to domestic violence in significant ways. The first is improving geographic justice. So as previous witnesses have already established, the court already has the inherent authority through well-established law to include firearm surrender conditions in emergency relief from abuse orders. And while this authority is exercised in Vermont on a daily basis, um, it's exercised inconsistently. Um, and so it may vary from judge to judge or from county to county. And whether or not a survivor is able to access this important and time sensitive relief, in our view, should not be dictated by which county you live in or which judge has rotated into the court in your, uh, in your area. But that access to justice should be available to all across the state. Uh, Chief Burke noted that there is an ongoing effort in Vermont called the Firearms Technical Assistance Program. Um, and this is a no money grant that was um, granted to the Vermont Attorney General's office and has brought together a group of stakeholders um, to look at various elements of the intersection of domestic violence and firearms. And this bill will really help to integrate with that process and new and improved court forms that are kind of an outgrowth um, of that project. So as part of that project, uh, Vermont's Family Court Oversight Committee is currently revising the relief from abuse order petitions um, to collect more detailed information from plaintiffs about the abuse they're experiencing and the extent 
to whether uh, the extent to which firearms are part of that abuse or whether they are at all. And so H-133 will really help to align these efforts and make sure that orders are tailored to the specific relief that's requested by plaintiffs in each situation. And third, I just wanted to highlight that we believe this bill will really provide clarity to all parties, not just plaintiffs. And while the bill doesn't um, intend to enhance the authority of the court to include firearms related conditions in ex parte proceedings, it clarifies the circumstances um, under which a condition may be issued. And it will really help provide clarity to all parties, plaintiffs, defendants, and judges in regard to the conditions. I wanted to take just a few brief moments to uh, respond to a little bit of testimony that you've already heard and speak to um, three key issues. First is the um, evidence burden in relief from abuse orders. And I'm sure you'll hear from other witnesses about this, but from our perspective, it's essential that the bill does not enhance the evidentiary or criminal liability on survivors when they're seeking emergency relief at this dangerous moment. Uh, ex parte emergency relief from abuse orders have always used a preponderance of evidence standard for orders and all of the related conditions and elevating the evidentiary burden to a higher standard such as clear and convincing would really have the impact of rendering the relief effectively impossible in the emergency setting. Um, and the vast majority of plaintiffs that are seeking this kind of relief are doing so pro se, they're doing so completely unrepresented. Um, so it, uh, it's not practical to think that, um, that a clear and convincing standard um, could be helpful for victims of domestic violence when they're unrepresented in the midst of leaving an abusive situation. Um, when they would be expected to introduce significant evidence and then the court would need an extended period of time to weigh such evidence, which really um, is at counter purposes to the exigent relief that's provided by ex parte orders. And I would just note that there have been numerous occasions where uh, this statute has been amended by the legislature for various reasons since its passage um, in, the, in uh, 1979 and 80. Um, and at each one of those has really affirmed the importance of the preponderance standard in emergency ex parte proceedings simply uh, because of the exigent circumstances that are often involved in these situations. Um, and I, in reflecting on Judge Grierson's testimony from last week, he raised some concerns and um, Bill Moore referenced this in his testimony as well earlier today. Um, to really ensure that the language of the bill meets the intent of the bill, which is to truly reflect current practice and ensure that the court retains its current um, discretion around ordering firearms surrender provisions when it is appropriate um, and when it is sought by the plaintiff. Um, and so we would support any needed adjustments to the language um, that may be brought forth by the court to ensure that the bill doesn't expand or narrow the court's inherent authority to issue these conditions, um, but that it, it meets the stated purpose of the bill. Um, and finally, I'll, I will just uh, make one quick note on firearm storage. I think it has been um, correctly noted by many members of the committee that this has been an ongoing conversation. And I would just like to say that for the first time in um, many years that um, it is not a, a, as I think Representative Burdett, you correctly noted, um, there's often a, we need to, uh, which goes before conversations about firearm storage. And I would say that the Firearms Technical Assistance Project for the first time in many years is providing us a, um, we are doing. And so there is current work underway led by law enforcement to create model policies and protocols related to um, service of uh, relief from abuse orders, especially when they involve firearms relinquishment conditions. Um, and so I would say that work is really ongoing. It is multidisciplinary. There's many stakeholders involved um, and we're feeling very optimistic about the outcomes of, of that process. That's it for me and I'm happy to take any questions. Great, thank you, Sarah. Committee members, any questions? Uh, Martin, and then Felicia. 
Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Sarah, for the testimony. Um, so I, I just had a couple questions about what kind of information that you might have regarding uh, what kind of uh, RFA outcomes we are seeing in the state. Uh, it was mentioned earlier as far as, you know, how many orders are we seeing uh, throughout the state uh, that, that might include uh, a relinquishment requirement for firearms? Is that is that information that you have or have access to? It's not information that I have. It would be information that would be um, collected by the court. And so it's probably a good question for Judge Grierson. And I um, believe that he can confirm um, this, but the court is moving to a new case management system currently. And my understanding is that in that new system, um, there will be opportunities to gather that level of granular detail. Um, but I would say anecdotally, we have a very um, clear sense, you know, our advocates working at 15 member organizations across the state, one of the things that they do is um, go with survivors weekly to court when they are seeking relief from abuse orders. They will also sit with survivors as survivors complete their paperwork seeking emergency relief from abuse. And I would say that what we see is that this sort of relief is fairly rare a variable across the state. So there are places where it happens slightly more often. There are places where it happens less often, um, but that it is certainly not in every order or even in a majority of orders, certainly not. And do you have any insight of why some counties or some judges might uh, be more apt to issue such an order versus others? And you know, maybe that's too speculative of a question, but I just wonder if, since you have 15 different organizations kind of in tune with what's going on locally in those different counties. Yeah, I, I'll defer to the judge on that other than to say um, that I, I think it can have to do with uh, judges seeking um, and looking for certain facts outlined in um, affidavits from survivors. And frankly, I, I also think that just the um, kind of cultural practices from county to county have been somewhat well established and uh, that that simply makes a difference. Um, and in uh, without really any statutory language clarifying the practice, um, what you see is variability. All right, thank you. Great, uh, Felicia and then Kate. Thank you. I I'd love to get your uh, opinion, Sarah, based on a lot of our existing statute um, and a lot of testimony that's been given on this bill, particularly when you rephrased and, and really asserted the importance of this bill's necessity in your opinion. Um, it kind of led me to, to ask, what do you really think that 133 has that we don't have either an existing inherent judicial authority or through the extreme risk protection orders um, from my reading of the bill and the testimony given so far, um, understanding kind of the history of these issues as they've worked forward in Vermont policy. Um, I only see a few changes and, and those are very concerning to me. So I'm interested to hear your point of view on what changes you see in 133 that don't exist um, somewhere in our system and what benefit those changes have. Yeah, uh, happy to answer that. So I would say the benefit that we see is just clarity and consistency. So it is clarity and consistency in practice um, and that's for all parties to really understand um, clearly the court's authority in these settings. And on, your, uh, on the other half of your question in regards to the extreme risk protection order, um, you know, I will, I'll let, uh, I believe David Chair is scheduled to testify today. And I know that probably from the prosecutor's perspective, um, they are the ones that have more insight in terms of how the extreme risk protection order process happens. I would just offer that it is a wholly separate process that um, is designed for a completely different purpose um, it is applied for completely differently. It is applied for by the state, not by an individual plaintiff operating pro se. Um, so it is a really very different, um, very different purpose and very different process. 
Yes, from my understanding, the uh, extreme risk protection order holds a, a much higher level of due process than prescribed in 133. I appreciate your comments. Yeah, and I, I'm happy to, uh, David may be able to speak to that. Um, and I would just note that I did submit a chart with um, my testimony that does highlight the evidence burden of various kinds of protection orders. Um, and in that you'll see that the relief from abuse orders at both stages, um, ex parte and final are a preponderance of the evidence sexual assault stalking orders, which are also applied for by the plaintiff, most often pro se are also preponderance of the evidence at both stages and the extreme risk protection order, which is a completely different process, um, but is also preponderance of the evidence at the ex parte stage. Thank you. Uh, Kate, I don't see your hand up, but I want to, I know it was up before. Yeah, sorry, I, I, I think it got swept out. Um, hey, Sarah, thanks for being here today. And I had a question that's come up in my community, um, sort of more globally around discussions of, of guns and access to guns and gun rights. Um, but I'm just, it's coming up in my mind as we're talking about this bill and that's, um, there are folks that tell sort of anecdotal stories about, um, women who are in situations where they might file for relief of abuse and are concerned for their imminent safety, obviously. Um, and that want to be able to have immediate access to firearms to protect themselves. Um, and I guess I'm curious, like, in your experience with the level of experience that you have in this area, if you could speak a little bit to whether, how that, you know, do, does that play out as you've seen it, does that play out in, in the world, in the real sort of world that you um, are privy to um, and with a potential, you know, with this bill, um, I think it's come up earlier uh, and I apologize if this, if this sort of next part of the question isn't for you to speak to, but if it were, if it were true that women who wanted to protect themselves wanted access to firearms in the house, how does that get entangled in any way with this kind of bill? If they sort of share the same home or have sort of, I don't know, you know, determining sort of ownership of firearms. So anyway, I'm just sort of curious along this line of, of discussion to hear your thoughts. It's a, it's a good question. Um, and I would say that by far, um, we're much, much more likely to hear from individuals that they are concerned about the presence of firearms in the home as it would relate to their safety um, in terms of it being used against them um, than the, the kind of situation you have described, though it's not, it's certainly not, un, not unheard of. Um, what I would say is that typically in a relief from abuse order proceeding, the relief is um, tailored to the relief that is requested by the plaintiff and the facts that are outlined in the affidavit and the um, it outlined in the affidavit and the petition. Um, and so there is some uh, control that, that the plaintiff has in terms of what kind of information they would like to provide in those documents. Um, Broadly, I would say that there is a good deal of research that indicates that regardless of who owns a firearm, whether it is owned by a person that is abusing their intimate partner or is owned by the victim of that abuse, that regardless of who owns the firearm, um, simply having a firearm in a house where there is abuse occurring increases the risk of death to the victim. Um, and so we certainly. Uh, do believe that the presence of firearms in a volatile and highly abusive situation um, most often, unfortunately, ends up um, can end up impacting the victim, regardless of um, who the firearm is owned by. Thank you. Can I ask a quick clarifying 
question. Um, so just to kind of maybe say back what, what I think I heard you just say, that in the process of, re- of, of filing for a relief from abuse, if it were the case that a person um, would feel a greater sense of safety, for example, with their partner leaving the home but being left in their own home with access to firearms, you're saying that the person filing the relief from abuse sort of would have some agency in terms of what they're asking for or looking for in terms of protection? That is correct. I wouldn't say that, you know, it's it's not completely, uh, once you file a judge is considering all the facts that are in front of them, um, but a plaintiff has a lot of, um, they are the ones bringing the claim for the petition for relief. And so they have a lot of agency in terms of what information they provide um, about the abuse that they are experiencing and the relief that they are seeking. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Can I see if there are any other, Tom, I can't tell if you're trying to put your hand up or. Yeah, I was looking first to see if Eric was here, at, uh, Fitzpatrick. <laughs> Uh, and the reason I was uh, um, uh, the reason I was looking for Eric is uh, I, I guess I need a little refresher course uh, um, just to have a better understanding on how ERPOs, uh, what ERPOs do, and, and and how they may complement the RFAs in protecting uh, the victims. And oh, there he is! Hey, Eric. <laughs> Yeah, I, I could follow up on that with you at a, at a subsequent time, Representative Burdett. I haven't reread that entire chapter just recently, but I can tell you that overall, the ERPO is uh, intended to create a, uh, an ability for a prosecutor to go into court. And when a person is in, uh, demonstrating an extreme risk of harm to themselves or others, and if they've demonstrated that they can show that there's an extreme risk of harm, a person's showing that potential harm to themselves or to other people, then the prosecutor, again, that's different than, there's a number of ways that it's different, but one of the ways is who can apply for it. So an ERPO generally applied for by a law enforcement officer. Well, you remember when we went back through the relief from abuse order statute, when we first started looking at H-133, those are household or family members. So you have two different groups of people that could apply for it. Um, and the uh, if the uh, prosecutor is able to demonstrate and the court finds that the, that the person who's subject to the order presents a, a risk of harm to themselves or to others, then they can issue uh, an order to um, temporarily, at least on a, it's set up similarly to the RFAs in the sense that there's an emergency and a final process. So the emergency order could instruct their firearms to be uh, relinquished for 14 days. And then I think the final order might be up to a year, but I'd wanna double check on that. Um, so that's kind of at least the initial sense of, of how they work. Thank you. Yeah, sure. And I can look into that in more detail. That would be helpful. Yes, please. Yep. Yeah. Great, thank you. Thank you, Eric. Uh, Martin. Martin, we can't, can't hear you. All right, it's good that I, I left it off mute as I was cussing at the fact that I was muted, muted. So my timing at least for that. In any event, sorry, sorry about that. Eric, actually it's a follow-up question for you, Eric. Um, sorry that you disappeared. Are you, still, are you still with us? Yep. There you are. So, <laughs> so I just wanna confirm, uh, uh, if you could, if you could tell me if, in fact, this is the case as far as a, a key difference. I know there are a lot of differences between an ERPO and a relief from abuse order, but with an, a relief a relief from abuse order, uh, there are two things that have to be proven, is my understanding, and that is that there has been abuse, that the defendant has abused uh, the the plaintiff, the person bringing the request for relief and that there's a danger of immediate further abuse. And my understanding with an ERPO is there's not a need to show that there has been 
some abuse. It's really more future looking. Am I, am I reading those two regimes correctly? Or is that something you need to get back to us on? No, I'm pulling it up right now. I think you're correct, but I just want to double check. Um, that's correct. So there's no, in the ERPO context, there's no requirement of a showing of past harm. You need to show, I'm reading the language from the emergency ERPO at the moment. You have to show that the person po poses an imminent and extreme risk of causing harm to himself or herself or another person by purchasing, possessing, or receiving a dangerous weapon or having a dangerous weapon within the respondent's custody or control. So it does have to have an affidavit. The affidavit has to show specific facts supporting those allegations, including the imminent danger and any dangerous weapons that uh, are believed to be in the person's possession. Okay, and in 13.11.04, the relief from abuse, the court has to find that the defendant has abused the plaintiff or the plaintiff's children and that there's a finding there's an immediate danger of further abuse. And then there's, you know, the affidavit requirement as well. But I, I just think that's a pretty critical uh, difference between those two uh, ways of proceeding with relinquishing weapons. So thanks, Eric. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else looking for committee? Uh, no? Okay, great. Thank you, Sarah, and thank you, Eric, for chiming in. So we'll now move to David Scher from the Attorney General's Office. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Committee, for the record, David Scher with the Vermont Attorney General's Office. Uh, first, I just want to state up front that the Attorney General does support this bill um, for many of the reasons that Sarah Robinson stated already uh, and others have stated. Uh, the Attorney General does believe this is a very important uh, safety measure for people who are in uh, dangerous situations um, and who need the protection of the state and the protection of the courts. And, um, uh, and for, the, for those reasons and for the reasons that have been elaborated more ably by others in terms of the underlying need for this, uh, the Attorney General does support it. One point I would, uh, well, a couple, a, a number of legal points I'd like to address that hopefully will be helpful for the committee and then I'm happy to answer questions. Um, with respect to what is lawfully allowed now, I would say that it's important to remember that the intent of this bill is not to change the law. It is to codify the common understanding of what the law is right now. Uh, and as the as Judge Grierson explained uh, and others have talked about, uh, it is broadly understood that the statutes currently allow this and that the uh, relevant case law uh, and the statutory chapter uh, allow for this to happen now. I will acknowledge plainly that um, that is not a universal viewpoint and that goes to the heart of why this bill is important. Uh, we want to remove all doubt and to make sure that this is relief that uh, every, every actor in the system knows quite plainly is available to them, uh, the ju that all judges know that this is available and that uh, plaintiffs, uh, people who need these relief from abuse orders know that it's available, that uh, advocates who may be helping people know it's available. Uh, so the, the, the importance of this bill is uh, even though we believe it's codifying what's currently allowed. We want to make sure that there is no more doubt about that and to uh, ensure that it is available to everybody. Um, a couple points I want to address with respect to uh, burdens of proof. We've heard some discussion around uh, preponderance of, a, of the evidence burden, which is the burden right now in ex parte orders uh, versus a clear and convincing evidence burden. Uh, I'd point out a couple things on this. Preponderance of the evidence is the current burden, and uh, and it's been the burden for uh, since the statute's been in existence. I'd also note that the um, in the emergency relief process under extreme risk protection orders, when this legislature had a chance to weigh in on the issue of what the burden should be for uh, potential orders for relinquishment of firearms, the legislature chose again to. Um, to make that a preponderance standard. And it's important to remember that under these uh, emergency orders, um, this is temporary. There will be another hearing. There has to be another hearing. 
uh, under both this and the extreme risk protection orders. And that is one of the due process safety nets that's in place. I'd also note that under current law, the court has available to it the ability to um, uh, limit, constrain constitutional rights, specifically First Amendment rights under, um, under uh, A1D of the emergency relief order. So it is currently the law and it has been found to be constitutional that that type of constraint on constitutional rights, on rights of freedom of expression, which are explicitly uh, contained in the First Amendment to the United States Constitution, um, that, is that is relief that's available to the court under a preponderance standard because of the uh, interests that are vital here in protecting people who uh, need protection from individuals who have been found to have abused uh, the plaintiff and who have been found to present an immediate danger of further abuse. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about the both the similarities and the differences between extreme risk protection orders and relief from abuse orders. There are actually a lot of similarities in the, um, the sort of due process aspects of these two statutes uh, in re with respect especially to emergency orders, uh, but there's very real and essential differences in terms of what uh, relief is available. And I should say, I should say more clearly who the relief is available to and, and uh, that's another, those differences are another reason why this statute is important, uh, why this bill is important. Um, some of the similarities are, are, as I've actually just gone over them a little bit with respect to uh, both of them have a preponderance standard. Uh, both of them are, you know, we're talking about temporary orders where a court then will have to come back and uh, have a hearing a contested hearing that's not ex parte that does have both parties involved in order to issue a final order that would be uh, that could potentially last much longer. Um, but I also think it's important. And, and so in that way, I actually think there's some similarities in the due process protections between these two statutes. Uh, both of them, uh, you know, again, the legislature just passed the extreme risk protection order relatively recently and, and found that it was reasonable to uh, use a preponderance standard to order relinquishment of firearms on a temporary basis when there was uh, an extreme risk of harm. Uh, there are differences though. Um, in some ways, you could argue that the RFA statute requires greater findings even than the, um, than the extreme risk protection order statute because the relief from abuse order statute, which we're talking about here, uh, does require that there have been an act of abuse already. Uh, which is not something that is required by the um, by the extreme risk protection order statute. And again, I, I know I'm reiterating some of what's been discussed, but these were uh, issues of the law that I do think it's important to, to establish clearly. Um, but the, I, I do want to address the really important differences here. And I think the single most important difference between these statutes is that the extreme risk protection order statute is really a mechanism for state actors to get involved when they recognize or are informed of danger and they uh, an extreme danger that somebody might um, present to another or to others. Um, and it allows for state actors, specifically state's attorneys or the attorney general's office to file a motion in court uh, requesting the relinquishment of firearms uh, if certain findings are made. Um, that is an important tool. We think it's a valuable tool, uh, but it does not allow for the immediacy that is needed for people who have suffered abuse and who need protection to go themselves to a courthouse, uh, sometimes after hours, and get the uh, protection that they need from a court. Uh, they, you know, if you were to try to substitute an extreme risk protection order, you'd have to go to the attorney general's office, have to go to a state's attorney. It's not clear how to, it's not always clear how to reach those people. They're not necessarily available after hours or it would be very hard for just uh, any random citizen to access those people. They may not be willing or able to uh, submit a uh, affidavit in time. The court may not hear it in time. So the, this is a really essential tool and not a it is not a replaceable tool uh, for allowing individuals to access courthouses quickly and uh, engage the power of the state in order to allow them to protect themselves and to have some protection. Um, 
I think that actually largely summarizes my comments. The only other thing I did want to note is Judge Grierson, last time we discussed this bill, had some ideas about how to uh, streamline the language and make sure that we were not accidentally restricting the power of the courts. And we certainly are open to uh, that discussion and happy to entertain amendments that the court might have uh, in respect to that. We certainly wouldn't want to uh, unintentionally go backwards in terms of uh, restricting the options that are available to the court. So happy when, when that comes up, when that's appropriate to discuss, happy to uh, in, engage with that process as well. Great, thank you. Thank you very much, David. Committee members, questions? Tom. Yeah, a little more refresher I need. So David, it, and, and I, I think this question is all right for you, but so ERPOs, do ERPOs talk about dangerous weapons or firearms or both? Um, I'm just pulling it up, make sure I'm looking at the right statute here. Um, they talk about dangerous weapons. Okay, and what about RFAs? Uh, the proposal right now is uh, is is limited to firearms. Right. Um, okay. So uh, why why would it be different? I th well, a couple of reasons. I think that um, frankly, we are uh, legislating on the side of caution here with respect to not broadening this more than. Um, you know, m more than we need to, to make sure we're, we're doing what um, we need to do to protect victims. Uh, another point I would make is that, again, uh, while courts have broad discretion to, 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 to issue orders to keep people safe, um, it is true that the case law is less clear on the authority regarding um, dangerous weapons as opposed to firearms. I don't think that, I, and to be clear, my read of the case law is not that a court could not issue an order um, with respect to keeping somebody, uh, you know, having somebody relinquish dangerous weapons or not have possession of dangerous weapons. I think that they could. Uh, it's just that that aspect of it is left a little bit more open, I think, by the case law. So we're really just um, being cautious by making this even more limited, frankly, than. Uh, than the extreme risk protection order uh, statute. Okay, uh, thank you. And, and, and just one more thing, I'm, I'm gonna guess you misspoke because you said that you were willing to entertain an amendment from the judge. And I would say that that's our job. That's correct, uh, Representative. My <laughs> apologies for, for right. that. Um, I meant an amendment along the lines of what the judge was talking about, but I obviously it's up to the committee to uh, to entertain anything like that. Right. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Felicia. Thank you. Um, just looking real quickly, um, David, you just mentioned something that caught my ear um, with regards to not including weapons, including specifically arms. You didn't want to broaden further the authority of the bill. Um, it's a little bit in conflict with Sarah's testimony that this strictly codifies, which muddies the waters further for me, since we've heard varying testimony on whether or not this codifies exactly what is currently um, accessible under judicial uh, discretion regarding RFAs or whether or not this broadens and codifies a different level of authority um, with regards to RFAs. So if you could just clarify whether or not you think 133 or the position of your office believes that 133 is codifying precisely what is currently practiced or whether or not we are expanding judicial authority here. It's our opinion that this is codifying what is currently lawful for courts to do. Um, we also acknowledge though that the law is necessary in part because that read of the law is not universal. I appreciate that input. It is um, a little jarring to hear 
different sides of what seems to be the same statement, making uh, make, make, making alternate claims, if I might, um, if we're not going to include weapons as a definition rather than firearms due to trying to keep it narrow, then why would we say judicial authority could include weapons if we're not going to codify exactly what the judges have now so that it is um, non-geographic justice as it's been mentioned, then, then why are we seeing this disparity? If we're going to codify practice, let's codify practice. If we're gonna change the law, let's change the law. And I'm, I'm, I think I'm just getting frustrated at uh, hearing sidestepping around the same term. So I appreciate clarification on that. Sure. So to be clear, it's not our position that this bill is codifying every option that is available to a court in a temporary relief from abuse order. It is codifying specifically what is available with respect to firearms. And we're not attempting to capture in this uh, all possible lawful remedies that a court could uh, issue under um, under the relief from temporary relief from abuse order statute. So, uh, you know, that could be a project that the committee may want to engage in, but that is not the uh, purpose of the bill as we read it. It is codifying one aspect of um, the authority that is, is making explicit in statute, I should say, one aspect of the authority that is available to the court. It's not attempting to make explicit all possible aspects of the authority that is available to the court. Thank you. Sorry, I couldn't find my unmute button there. Um, I appreciate you clarifying that this is a bill targeting firearms. Not seeing any other hands. I'll just give committee members a, a moment. Um, Judge Gerson, I see you are just came on. Did you want to uh, respond to something? A couple, uh, please, um, if the chair would allow. I, I just want to clarify uh, the last issue that was raised, but even more importantly, uh, back to the earlier uh, question by Representative Leffler, and that was about uh, gathering this data. Um, while I was listening to witnesses, I did um, check with somebody who I feel is um, on the ground floor with this new case management system. And they reported to me that they believe the new system will be able to capture um, these orders and um, which orders contain relinquishment of firearms. Uh, I don't have the details on it, but it's certainly uh, under the existing case management system, um, or if you want the legacy system that is has been shut down now. So all courts are now either on the Odyssey or they're transitioning to Odyssey. So the old case management system would not provide this detail, but I am told um, that the new case manager system should be able to um, capture this data. Um, I don't think it's in place yet. I don't know what it would take to put it in place, but I'm at least told um, that that information uh, should be able to be gathered, which is different than what I said before, which um, a, a couple of things though, uh, the question came up about weapons. And this bill is designed to address the issues relating to uh, relinquishment, non-possession of firearms. Um, what I have said or tried to say is that we believe, uh, most judges believe, and as David said, it's not unanimous. It's in part not unanimous because not all judges respond to me when I send out a, when I try to determine where they are on this. But a large number, by far the majority of judges feel that they have the inherent authority uh, to order relinquishment of firearms. That's what the purpose of this bill is, is to clarify and codify that. We also have inherent authority uh, to, to issue orders on any number of things. And I, and I, I could not go into a, a list of, uh, 
of all the things that I think we can do. But I will say with respect to the issue around weapons, I pulled up our, um, the current temporary order, um, ex parte temporary order provides this language. Once the court has determined that the order should issue, there is a specific section that talks about um, weapons and firearms. And it reads as follows, until further order of the court or until this order expires. It's a blank to so-and-so shall hold the following weapons belonging to the defendant. Next line, delivery of the weapons shall be made in the following manner. Next line, it talks about a receipt of firearms. So broadly speaking, that's what's in that's what's in the order now. So by if the committee decides to adopt this bill or some um, version of it, um, the fact that it refers specifically to firearms doesn't mean that our authority to confiscate other weapons um, is gone, is lost. In fact, we will still have that inherent authority. One of the difficulties is that anything can be a weapon. Um, so if if you want to further codify um, or clarify, you can add weapons to this language, but it's already in the order and we have the authority to uh, confiscate weapons now. Um, so I, I don't think is anything necessarily inconsistent between what this bill speaks to um, in our authority to confiscate either weapons or firearms. Um, so I, I don't know if that answers uh, Representative Leffler's question or not, but I'll be glad to if she... um. It, it does answer some of my questions. I appreciate um, your very quick turnaround on, on the data question and uh, your continued input on this bill, Your Honor. I, I, I surprised myself with the turnaround on the data. I, I really didn't, I did not think that uh, that the system could produce that as apparently as it can. So I'm glad that I discovered that myself. Um, there, just. Madam Chair, just a couple other points that came up during other, as I listened to other witnesses' testimony. When, I'll go back to um, Will Moore's, Mr. Moore's testimony, he talks about uh, the language in the bill that, that I basically objected to, the reference to affidavit and complaint. What I was trying to say was that that language is not necessary because we are going to have a complaint and affidavit. They, they will be filed anyway. It doesn't have to reference it in the statute for the judge. The only thing that the court relies on in an ex parte proceeding is the affidavit of the, of the plaintiff. And that if an affidavit isn't filed, we can't order anything. So it's the affidavit that creates the factual basis for any, any courts. Uh, decision. Um, it was the feeling of many judges that by just referencing specifically the complaint and affidavit, um, that it, it somehow restricted them. So my suggestion was that we eliminate that part of the language and simplify um, the, the bill as it's now written to say that the court can order relinquishment uh, of firearms or non-possession of firearms. Um, so it, it, it's, it, that information will still be available to us. There, there was also some testimony by a number of folks. The question is, is this going to increase the number of relinquishments or not? And I think it was uh, Chief work that said, you know, it's speculative to say that. And, and I would agree with him. And the other day when I testified, I think my testimony was that I said I, two things. One, I think Representative Burdett said he thought it was a mandatory and it is not mandatory. The court still with this language 
has to exercise their discretion in the sense that is there there is are there facts before us that warrant um, a relinquishment of firearms, and that is very dependent on what is in the the uh, the affidavit and the complaint. And as one other witness, I believe it was Ms. Robinson, testified, we have a standing. Uh, it's referred to as the Family Oversight Division Committee. We have standing committees for each division, family, criminal, civil, probate, and so forth. And they periodically review legislation that's coming their way. They make recommendations for the judiciary to uh, um, propose legislation. But we also, and it's almost a never ending process sometimes to continue to review the forms. We review them for errors. Uh, we review them to improve readability uh, for litigants, um, particularly in the family division. Many of you know, many of the litigants, the majority of them, the litigants are self-represented, without benefit of counsel. So we're continually looking at these these forms, and as one of the witnesses said, we are in the process of looking at um, changing language in the forms to further identify, uh, or for the plaintiff to identify whether uh, whether there are firearms. Uh, the, the the affidavit now has a general reference to it. And these forms will call for information from the plaintiff if they have that, if they know that information. It's a two, really a two-step process for the plaintiff. One, are they aware of um, the existence of firearms? Um, and even if they are aware of them, um, it's entirely up to the plaintiff whether they disclose that in the affidavits. Um, so when we talk about will the relinquishment of firearms be increased uh, by virtue of adding this language or this, this suggestion I've made to simplify it even more, um, you know, it, it's not, I can't imagine that the number of relinquishments ordered that we don't know right now anyway, will go down. Let's start with that. There's no reason for it to go down. So that means it either stays exactly the same or there could be an increase. And so in that sense, I'm, there could be an increase. Um, but the question really is, is that this form, the, the language putting into this form um, causing any increase? Let's, let's assume for the sake of argument for the committee's discussion that there will be an increase. Just assume that. The question is not whether that increase is attributable to adding this language to this bill. It may be that the information that is available to the court through these revised forms um, will provide more information than the court has. So I, I just think the committee needs to be careful in, and I understand the concern from, from uh, Mr. Moore, uh, Mr. Davis and others that have testified, um, but if there is an increase, I, I don't know how we're going to identify it attributable to this change language. Um, because there, there will be changes coming to the form that I think will provide the court with more, more information um, around this, this subject. Um, the, the last points I want to make, um, the first witness today, Mr. Davis, talked about search warrants, and I don't want to confuse the issue, but I want to again remind the committee, it has not been my experience, um, and, and as many of the committee members know, I continue to sit uh, in these dockets uh, when I'm not in legislative session, so that I still sit on criminal dockets, uh, relief from abuse dockets, so forth. It has not been my experience, it's a rare experience, if a search warrant and a request for relief from abuse were requested at the same time. I am not telling you that it can't happen, but we have to remember that the relief from abuse process is a civil process, number one, in and of itself does not provide a basis for a search warrant. There may in fact be an underlying criminal charge at the same time. It could be a domestic assault, it could be something involving a weapon, firearm, or otherwise. 
that the police are independently investigating. Um, and therefore, they may have information separate and apart from the relief from abuse order that provides a basis for a search warrant so that when they receive the relief from abuse order, they may in fact uh, serve a warrant at the same time. There's nothing that prevents them from doing that. Um, but it, it, it is, they are two separate proceedings. Um, and it, although there are sometimes when a um, um, plaintiff will be in a police station seeking a restraining order, that doesn't necessarily mean there is police involvement in the underlying circumstances. They may be using the police station as a safe place to seek out an order, but not necessarily reporting a crime. Uh, having said that, I, I think it's important to understand that there's nothing that prevents the police from getting them, assuming they have the evidence that is necessary uh, to seek out a warrant and there's a basis for the warrant separate and apart from the from the restraining order. Um, and I think I, I'll just I'll just close with this and, and I think I testified to it the other day. When we're talking about the burden of proof and, and I understand um, both from um, the, the domestic violence um, uh, witnesses uh, and from uh, law enforcement uh, from from the um, uh, Mr. Moore, Mr. Davis, Mr. Bradley, uh, the I guess the attention that any time we're involved with gun uh, legislation, it, it creates a certain amount of discussion as we're seeing here. But the burden of proof um, isn't related to whether or not we take firearms or whether or not we remove somebody from the house or whether or not we give one parent uh, uh, um, custody of the children. Um, what we're determining by that preponderance of evidence is whether or not there has been abuse. That's what the, that's what the burden is. The rest of these issues, whether it's who gets the house, what contact, if any, is between the plaintiff and, in the defendant or the defendant and the children, uh, who gets possession of vehicles, what happens with firearms or any other uh, weapon are all matters that come within the discretion of the court depending on the particular facts before them. So I just think it's important uh, to remember when we're talking about the burden of proof, we're not talking about the burden of proof as it relates to whether or not someone should relinquish firearms. It's whether or not there's been abuse. And the rest of this is the relief that is uh, uh, granted in, in an individual case, depending on the individual facts before the court. So I, I just thought it was important to clarify, uh, at least from my perspective, some of the issues that came up today. And hopefully I didn't confuse the, uh, the issues any more than they already are, but I'm glad to answer questions about any of those topics, if it would help. Uh, the committee or committee members. Sure, great. No, thank you very much. Um, so Tom, we'll take your question. And then I see that we do have um, Commissioner Sherling from DPS here. And I want to make sure that we can get to him, especially since he joined us with very little notice. So Tom. All right. Uh, uh, Judge, you did confuse me a little bit. So <laughs> uh, no, you talked about the forms you're going to revise. Yes. And, 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 and I think I understood you when you said that a new question that's going to be put on there is about firearms in a household. Yes. So if, if somebody came in for a relief from abuse or ERPO, I, I don't think it would matter which. And that wasn't a concern. Uh, if firearms weren't a concern and they weren't brought up, is are they given that form to fill out with that question about firearms on it? Well, the affidavit, the, the complaint and affidavit are forms. So they, the information is there, but they do not have to fill it out. There's nothing that requires them to complete that portion of the affidavit. Right. No, I understand that. And, and uh, I would hope that that would be explained to the person filling it out that they, they don't need, need to. Because what's going through my mind is... Uh, to me, you know, being a lay person, it, it seems to me that it may be skirting on some privacy issues uh, when the, the firearms weren't in, 
at this point aren't an issue and but there's questions by uh, uh the the judiciary to me slash government asking for information about firearms and and then once you know that information is had by you know judiciary slash government is the way that i look at it is at the start of a list uh because if there is there is no issue at all while the, this stuff is being filed then to me there's no business even asking about firearms um if i guess if there was a distinction on there uh, of some kind that if in the initial uh filing of a rfa or erpo uh that may be a, a different situation as far as i'm concerned to be able to ask about the firearms but again to just to I'm going to repeat myself, but when when firearms are not an issue, why are they being asked about? Well, we don't know whether they're an issue or not. And right now, um, the 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 current affidavit does have a reference uh, to either firearms or weapons. I'm trying to track it down right now for you, Representative Burdett. But yep. we don't we don't know when anyone calls or really from abuse. We have no idea what the information is. And our order already provides that we can uh, uh, relinquish, uh, order relinquishment or surrender of firearms. Um, and the affidavit, and I'll try it, as I said, track it down, um, yeah. or you already has a reference to it. So it's not as if we haven't raised the question before within the affidavit, but it's up to the plaintiff whether they want to provide that information or not. There's nothing that compels them to do so. Right. I, I guess uh, I'm, I'm a, I am a little confused because I thought that the plaintiff had to, at some point, say that there was uh, a fear because of the firearms. Well, well no, they don't. The, the affidavit... Um, And what they complete in the affidavit is entirely in the hands of the plaintiff. There may be firearms in the house. There may be, the defendant may have firearms. The plaintiff doesn't have to identify them, doesn't have to indicate them. Right, right. But that's what I'm saying is if, 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 a, if a plaintiff files or, or, or is looking to get a relief from abuse of some kind or ERPO and, and to them, uh, they don't bring up firearms because they don't consider firearms, uh, they, they don't feel threatened because of the firearms, that somebody is going to use the firearms on them, but then they're hand, handed, a, you know, uh, quotations around it, I guess, a, a, an official uh, a document that asks about firearms. It, it, again, to me, that, that seems like it, it's, uh, it's almost fishing in, in, in uh, looking for a potential problem that uh, isn't there because the, you know, the, the victim or defendant or whatever, not the defendant, the victim doesn't think they're an issue. Um, Representative Burdett, all I can say is if they don't think they're an issue, then they're certainly not required to, to fill that out. Right, right. But I guess my question is, is why even ask at that point? Why ask? We're trying to, if you, if you come from the perspective that the purpose of a relief from abuse order, assuming that the plaintiff has demonstrated the, uh, that there has been abuse or fear of imminent, uh, fear of imminent abuse, um, then the question becomes what is necessary for the safety of, of the plaintiff and or children involved? So firearms certainly are an issue for any uh, court considering this, this type of case. And that's why I'm saying we grant, we grant orders now of uh, surrender, even without this language. So um, I guess with that form, what kind of instructions are given to the person that's, that's filling it out or answering the questions? Uh, is, is there any... Uh, uh, guidance as far as uh, uh, very uh, 
I would want it very specific that they they knew exactly what they were filling out and uh, that they, um, again, with guidance that they don't have to answer those questions because some people may not may not want to if they had that guidance. But being a uh, an official form, they may feel uh, compelled that they have to fill it out. Yeah, I, you know, the, the, the forms are made available to folks. They can come to the courthouse and pick up the forms if they're so inclined. Some of them uh, fill out the forms with the assistance of uh, uh, advocates. Uh, sometimes uh, they're filled out with attorneys assisting them, very rarely, but it does happen um, if there's an ongoing divorce case. Um, and the court provides uh, personnel after hours, um, but in, in providing someone after hours to assist them, it's assisting them in the processing of the complaint. They're not there to give them uh, advice um, on, on, you know, the, unless questions are asked about the form, but they're not there to say, here's the form. You, you don't have to fill out certain sections. Yeah, thank you. I, I also think it'd be helpful if we could get a form that might also be helpful if we could if we could see it as we have um, had in the uh, in the past this committee. Um, I did see the commissioner's hand up. Uh, commissioner, I don't know if you were responding to to Representative Burdett or. I was, Madam Chair, thank you. Uh, for the record, Mike Sherling, Commissioner of Public Safety. I was just going to add, I think uh, Judge Grierson co uh, covered most of it, but uh, as a risk assessment is taking place, um, not only for the court, but often um, these orders, uh, the, the statements and affidavits are filled out um, at uh, police departments in the presence of law enforcement who then have to serve the orders and um, the information that's contained there not only helps the court to determine um, whether an order should be issued, but then if one is issued or if it's not, uh, it helps law enforcement to safety plan uh, with the person who's requesting the order. Um, and it helps uh, safety plan for any potential service of an order uh, by the law enforcement agency. So there's a variety of reasons why uh, knowing whether there are weapons in the house is important. It doesn't always go uh, to a specific risk of those weapons, but it's it's certainly something we would not want to overlook in uh, in that initial assessment of uh, of the overall um, context of uh, the request for the order. Thank you, Commissioner. I, I can certainly appreciate that. So so with that said, um, you've gone through the whole process. Uh, papers served. Uh, it's uh, determined, uh, uh, you know, uh, an extended order or permanent order isn't done. What, what happens to that information? Uh, it's contained in, in uh, law enforcement databases uh, in perpetuity. Um, they're not accessible to the public. I think you would uh, be surprised to learn how much information is in those uh, databases around um, weapons. <laughs> I don't whether it's, know. <laughs> well, people people report them stolen. Um, people report you know, damage to firearms. The people report that firearms have been involved in things. So there's a lot of intersection with uh, people's personal information, but it is not publicly uh, available. Right. No, and and I can understand and appreciate that. I just. I just have issues with people giving up uh, private uh, information, I guess you could say, uh, for no reason. And, and, and it going into, a, a, um, a, again, a, a government database, so to speak. And, and I can appreciate the reasons why. I mean, if something else happened down the road, you'd have some information about somebody. But, um, but you have information uh, that was collected, in, in my eyes, uh, for no reason, because nothing happened. There were, you know, there's no charges or anything that, that, that were filed. But anyway, that's, uh, I, I have that concern with, uh, with information and lists. So thank you. Thank you. So Judge Greer, it's okay. I'm going to um, stick with the commissioner for now, um, given 
um, given the time and I do see other hands up, but Commissioner, um, thank you so much for joining us on such a short notice. Uh, so I wanted to um, hear your thoughts on the, on the bill. I know there's um, concerns about storage that have been um, expressed. And uh, so I welcome you, thank you. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, I won't reiterate uh, Major Jonas's testimony. I think she spoke to the department's position on the bill as uh, in a fairly um, simple and effective way. Uh, it, I uh, am aware that there were um, uh, concerns raised around uh, storage. I think uh, Chief Burke and Judge Grierson's assessment that we don't know to what extent uh, this would change uh, the number of firearms that would require storage. There's no way to assess that. Um, but if the committee recalls testimony from last year, um, this ongoing narrative around a uh, lack of storage capability for firearms is real for some agencies, but I, I just want to put folks at ease that um, the, the, the state system to back up agencies and offload firearms that are no longer uh, no longer needed to be stored is now functioning. Um, and moreover, that we stand ready to assist any agency that has uh, a storage overflow problem with creative solutions in the event that uh, that issue presents itself. So um, that should not be something that stands in the way of uh, if, it, if in your judgment, this is a good piece of public policy, um, storing items should not be something that stands in the way of victim safety. Great. Thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, Felicia and then Bob. Thank you. Um, just uh, something that kind of popped out at me uh, from Representative Burnett's line of questioning. You mentioned that all of the records that are received regarding gun ownership related to testimony given in affidavits uh, for RFAs would not be public. It's my understanding that affidavits are public record. Could you? Yes, correct. Uh, he was asking about what happens after uh, things have passed. So the affidavit filed in court would be public. The application um, or the report that if it were to come through a law enforcement agency and important to note that uh, a cross section of things do pass through law enforcement agencies when there are requests for um, abuse prevention orders and some go direct to the court, some go through advocacy organizations. So they don't all come through law enforcement, but to the extent to which there is a um, a document that is created and then the adjudication happens. Uh, the contents of that document uh, in the law enforcement database are not necessarily public. Okay, I appreciate that clarification that law enforcement database, not public, affidavit, still public. Yes, and to be clear, the, an affidavit of probable cause filed by a law enforcement officer, the copy that is in law enforcement's hands is public. This is a different, um, this is a civil process to obtain protection, it's a different thing. Appreciate that. Uh, two more questions for you. You mentioned creative solutions to storage, um, which bears my interest on quality of storage and comes back to who carries the burden of uh, damage. If, if there is any humidity damage, damage from uh, improper storage, just general wear and tear, nicks and bangs here and there. Um, who currently bears the responsibility? Um, and do you believe that that would transfer over through this bill as written? Uh, I can't speak to liability transfer because uh, I did not go to law school. Um, I can just speak operationally, um, having spent uh, a few years uh, in Burlington where we stored thousands and thousands of firearms. Uh, I cannot recall an instance where there was a damage claim uh, on a firearm um, and they were stored in cold storage. So not a significant amount of uh, humidity control. Um, and at one point, actually early on in my career, they were stored in the basement of an ancillary building. And same, uh, same answer, we, that just, that, that never became 
uh, an issue. If it were ever an issue, <clears throat> where does the responsibility lie? Just looking to kind of parse that. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I can speak to uh, what, if it was a case that uh, either Burlington or uh, now the state police had, I think that would be um, the agency who's got uh, control of that piece of property, whether it be a firearm or a piece of electronics or anything else. Okay, thank you very much. I forgot to write down my third question, so I might circle back. Um, Felicia, I think I heard you say something about the storage and this bill liability and this bill. Could you restate that question, please, so the commissioner can respond to that? Um, sure, it was if, so the bill could propose that an RFA could order uh, the relinquishment of firearms, I would presume, to the serving law enforcement officer, as has been testified. My curiosity lied as to who is responsible for any damage or anything we're in from when it leaves the owner's hands to when, if it is returned. That was the crux of the question. And I believe you answered it, that it lies with the law enforcement agency that holds possession, if that's correct. That's correct. And uh, I, I guess I would further clarify that uh, or, or expound that um, in cases where a government is involved, everyone gets sued when something gets damaged. So it's, that ultimately is for the court to decide who bears the liability, but everybody's name ends up on the other side of the little V. That's a, a fun take on it. If only everyone could afford to sue. Um. And commissioners, is my understanding that this bill doesn't change anything currently, or does it? Um, again, that would be my understanding uh, as well, Representative, um, that this clarifies and codifies existing practice. But I would defer to uh, Judge Grierson as the definitive uh, source of information on that. I was, I was referring to the storage piece of it. Oh, the storage piece, yes. That uh, I don't see a a substantive change relative to storage uh, as drafted. Thank you. Uh, Bob. Commissioner, thanks for being here. Uh, the question I had, <clears throat> I heard you use, use the term risk assessment. Now that's been used in this committee for uh, quite some period here for the past week or so. So I, I can assume for clarification, for my purposes, when you refer to risk assessment, you're talking about a risk assessment for a matrix you may or may not be using upon sending troopers and or officers back to a particular residence to seize any potential firearms? Yes, uh, both the risk assessment for that kind of law enforcement operation, uh, as you're uh, well aware, and also uh, we use uh, now risk assessments for um, domestic violence cases to assess the uh, the level of risk posed to uh, a, a victim or survivor. Okay, so it is a law enforcement risk assessment, not a core risk assessment, correct? Correct. There may be, I, I should say, there there are instances where the courts use risk assessments as well. Um, I don't know the answer to uh, under what circumstances. Thank you. Okay. Any other Questions for the commissioner. Thank you so much. Is commissioner, is there anything else you'd like to, to add at this point? I I don't think so. Um, I think I'm good. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Um so Judge Grierson, I, I did cut you off. Um, I don't know if you wanted to add anything at this point. That's all right. It gave me time to uh, check on the existing um, affidavit that's used now. And the language currently reads um, from the affidavit, other past incidents of serious violence or threats that support my request for an order include, and then there's a space obviously for the person to fill it out. But underneath that, it, there is a, another clause that says, be specific. For each incident, state when and where it happened, who else was there, and details about any injuries resulting or weapons used. And then they fill it out in a narrative form. And then there's another line, and again, I'm reading from the current affidavit. To my knowledge, the defendant is or is not in possession of a dangerous weapon. 
And then as I indicated earlier, the, the order, the present form order calls for um, relinquishment, if you will, of uh, dangerous weapons. And there's a reference to receipt for firearms. Um, so essentially what we're doing with this new uh, form is revising uh, the form, but it already speaks to, uh, uses the term dangerous weapons and then you have to describe it. So, great. That's all I had. Great. Thank you very much. And and again, my understanding is that the judge works with what he or she has in front of him in that affidavit. Correct. Sure. Yeah. And right. I mean, the the judge we do not get involved. I mean, the affidavits are presented to us, and and we don't engage in a discussion with the plaintiff uh, about the, the contents of the affidavit. And the, the, the court personnel who are involved in these after hours calls understand they're not giving legal advice uh, to, to these folks. They're there to assist them in processing the, uh, the complaint and the, the information. Great, great. thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, anything else before we before we adjourn and go off YouTube, committee members? Great. All right. Well, thank you. I uh, thank everybody. Thank the committee and witnesses, and uh, we will now adjourn.